more than 2,000 years ago, the wind whistling down off the north slopes of Mount Olympus brought clouds and rain to the place called Aegea, the royal city of Macedonia. But Aegea disappeared from the map of northern Greece in antiquity, and the modern search for the legendary city of ancient Macedon and the lost tombs of the kings who were buried there began only in recent times. Looking back now, there weren't many clues pointing the way to Aegea for historians and archaeologists. But the search finally ended less than two years ago in this tiny village in northern Greece, with the most spectacular archaeological discoveries since those of Tutankhamun more than 50 years ago. Local workmen who excavate on the site to the hundreds of visitors who have already trekked there from all over the world, the finds at Vergina are now synonymous with the name of one man, Manolis Andronikos, professor of archaeology at the University of Salonika in Greece. Andronikos has lived with the archaeology of Vergina since he first visited the village 40 years ago as a young student. For most of those years, he has worked totally unknown to the general public. But what has happened here since October 1977 already means that his name is going to be as famous as any of the celebrated archaeologists of the past. There is still a vast area left to dig, and for Andronicus, much more yet for him to find. Every day, his team excavates in the shadow of an almost vertical slab of earth, under which they believe the next series of finds will be discovered. But no archaeologist starting work on an ancient burial site can be sure that tomb robbers thousands of years before have not got to the prize first. My only hope was to find a Macedonian tomb unlooted because I, I was thinking that uh, if uh, we can't uh, find a tomb working uh, uh, as archaeologists uh, uh, for years, for the, for the robbers, it could be impossible for one or two nights to make a well and find the, uh, the tomb as they used to, to make. Uh, they, they used to work just for one night or two nights, make a well, find the tomb and rob it. Uh, so I had always the hope that uh, it could be uh, possible to find at least one big Macedonian tomb unlooted. The mainland of ancient Greece stretched from the sprawling area of Macedonia in the north to the powerful city-states of the south. The area around Vergina is not mentioned in ancient accounts of Macedonia, and yet it was obviously very important between two and three thousand years ago. Just outside the village is an extensive area of burial mounds. Excavating here more than twenty years ago, Andronicus found evidence of local traditions connected with southern Greece. He also knew that nearby, the French archaeologist Léon Houzet had excavated a marvellous but looted Macedonian tomb a hundred years ago. Inside the tomb, Houzet found a marble throne, which in Macedonia meant the tomb must have been made for a king. 
but still there was no clue as to what place Vergina had been in ancient times. Forty years ago, Andronicus assisted the excavation of the remains of this vast palace overlooking the tomb, the village, and the field of burial mounds. Yet, despite the powerful archaeological associations, there was no evidence which could be used to reveal its ancient identity. There was, however, one other feature at Vergina which Andronicus believed might have the answers. In the centre of the village was a huge man-made mound archaeologists call a tumulus. Forty feet high and flat-topped, it covered an oval area the size of a football pitch and had been constructed from thousands of tons of earth. This model shows how it once looked. Archaeologists before Andronicus believed that a crater in the centre of the mound had formed because a tomb had collapsed far below. Andronicus wasn't convinced, but he wanted to excavate and in 1952 he widened the crater area and drove 22 feet down into the mound. But it was not far enough. Still 20 feet from ground level and with all his money gone, Andronicus turned his attention to the small mounds outside the village. When he returned in 1962, he began in the northeast section and cut a massive trench almost to the middle of the mound. The trench, more than 30 yards long and 13 yards deep, did not uncover a tomb. But what Andronicus did find were pieces of broken tombstones in the loose earth. Some, like these, were pieces of a fine painted tombstone from the 3rd century BC. Others bore inscriptions of the dead from the same period. Whatever this place had been in antiquity, Andronicus was convinced it could not be Aegea. Most historians placed the ancient capital of Macedonia at the site of ruins further north. But then, in this book, the English scholar Nicholas Hammond suggested that historians had put Aegea in the wrong place. Hammond referred to an incident in antiquity related by Plutarch in which a garrison of mercenaries from Gaul left on duty in Aegea in the 3rd century BC broke open the tombs of the kings who were buried there and insolently scattered their bones. Andronicus knew that Greeks, even in their most fierce battles, never destroyed the tombs of the dead. Hammond's references startled him. For me it was a revelation. I said to myself, if the gods destroyed the royal tombs, certainly they didn't uh, they did not destroy only the, the royal tombs, but other tombs too. Then we, we can have an explanation for the uh, broken tombstones. With the new evidence, there was obviously something wrong with the placing of ancient Aegea on all the maps of Greece. Aegea at Vergina made sense of all the archaeological evidence. By 1976, Andronicus' theory that he was in fact digging in the royal graveyard of Macedonia brought him new funds from his university. He decided to open another trench, this time from the southeast. But for 30, 35, 36 uh, days, I don't remember well, uh, we had no result and I was disappointed. But uh, next day, after the, the final trials for this year, for, I mean for 77, well, I decided to start again from another point for next year. The place Andronicus chose was only slightly further around, a shade to the west of the longest axis of the mound. This time there were no trees to hamper progress. Going in and down, they found the colour of the earth changing. And then finally, they exposed a few blocks of dressed stone. In the next few days, hundreds of tons of earth were cleared away, revealing a great deal more to the excavators. In addition to a large Macedonian tomb, still partly covered, there was a small rectangular tomb, and the foundations of a much bigger structure which had been destroyed in antiquity. 
Scores of sightseers travel to Vergina every week in the hope of catching a glimpse of Andronicus or the tombs. But security, strictly imposed, is only one among many problems facing the archaeologist. As well as being a scientist who could dissect this huge mound with the efficiency of a surgeon, Manolis Andronicus has had to become a bureaucrat, politician, diplomat, administrator, ambassador and public relations expert since he first found those squared blocks of stone. There are continuing problems of money, of restoration, of engineering, expertise and facilities for storage. And only on very rare occasions is he prepared to break off essential work to show visitors around the site. We tried from this, exactly from this uh, point. Mm. And uh, now we are going to where we started. We started just from this point. Mm. And here we found the first wall, the small one I told you before. Yeah. And we realized that we are before a tomb, a second round, and a third. The tombs have now been roofed over and insulated to maintain a constant humidity and temperature. It took a week to clear the smaller tomb of earth, only to find it had already been robbed. But when we reached, uh, we found this smaller tomb, which is quite important for us. The mural shows Pluto's rape of Persephone as she gathered flowers in the plain of Enna in Sicily. Watching horrified is the goddess's friend, Chiani. The chariot carrying Pluto to his underworld kingdom has been executed in marvelous detail and with stunning perspective. The mural, the first big wall painting found from the ancient world, is the work of a great artist. Andronicus believes it might be the legendary Nicomachos, who was said to have painted the Greek myths in the 4th century BC. Two other walls of the tomb were painted. This lone figure on the narrow east wall is probably by the same artist. A frieze below of flowers flanked by griffins is probably a common form of decoration. But the figure was puzzling. She might be the goddess Demeter, mother of Persephone. But Andronicus thinks the painting is probably a representation of the woman who was buried in the tomb. This was the, the big tomb we found almost together with the other. Uh, and here we are in the facade of the big tomb. Uh, all the facade is very interesting, but the most important uh, uh, thing here is this marvelous uh, wall painting above the facade, this frieze, with all these pedestrians and uh, riders, uh, the animals, a lion, boars, uh, a deer, uh, the trees, uh, the, the whole of painting is uh, uh, unique. Uh, the persp uh, perspective, uh, the composition, uh, the drawing, the colors, everything is, uh, I can say, magnificent. The hunters still pursue their quarry in a winter landscape. But small areas of paint have crumbled away from the 16 feet long stone facade with the loose earth which had been packed against it. Until these discoveries, only a few small areas of Greek wall painting had been found. But several Roman copies in Pompeii and Herculaneum suggested their beauty. Yet the paintings from both tombs have strikingly dissimilar styles. And Andronicus thinks this larger mural may have been painted by Philoxenus of Eritrea, a student of Nicomachus. The small tomb was looted, but it was very important. 
And uh, as the small one was looted, we were almost sure that the big one also, also was robbed. But the moment when uh, we realized that the door was in, in its place and was closed, well, to be true, I was not here. It was the only moment I was not here, and my assistant, Mrs. Uh, Miss uh, Drugu, called me on the telephone and told me that she found the, the door and uh, that the door was closed. I came at once and I realized, I thought that 90% the tomb was uh, unlooted. Well, it was uh, uh, almost unbelievable. Uh, from this poor moment, we had many difficulties because uh, as the, uh, the work uh, was done in the late days of October, we had to stop the work and we, we were thinking of uh, leaving uh, the barrel vault uh, for next year. When we are realized that the door was closed, we had to open the, the tomb, and the only way was to take off the last uh, stone of the vault, the key stone as we call it, was uh, just behind the wall of the tomb. And when we took off the, the stone, I, I had a look inside, where some, people, some colleagues outside and I described what I was looking off in the tomb. Uh, well, uh, I couldn't say everything because uh, I was uh, I was seeing some gold things and I didn't like to uh, to exclaim that uh, there are treasures there.
promised uh, the first moment I was disappointed because, uh, well, uh, I, I, I had in my mind that uh, the whole chamber could be plenty of, of things and it was not, of course, because it was too, too big, the, the chamber. It was 4.48 to 4.48 is a square and all things were on the west uh, part of the, of the chamber. Uh, but after one moment I realized that the, the finds are marvelous. We had first to make the photographs, and then make the drawings, to put everything in, uh, in the plan, on the plan, uh, to number all, all them, and uh, to arrange for the transport to the museum. Uh, but uh, we have seen, myself and my assistants, everything on the floor in the chamber. But uh, in the chamber was a marble sarcophagus. And I realized at once that uh, the size of the sarcophagus could have a, a vase, a bronze vase or something like that, uh, in which the burned bones of the dead uh, should be. It was a cremation, it was obvious. And uh, I hoped that the, this vase, which uh, uh, I didn't uh, see for the moment, uh, I was sure that it was in the marble sarcophagus, uh, sarcophagus which was covered, uh, should be a marvelous uh, bronze vase with uh, reliefs or other things. But when the third day we uncovered the sarcophagus, we saw this gold casket, uh, which was something which nobody knew before that. It was the first time we saw uh, this casket, uh, Larnax, as we call it in ancient Greek, which was known only from Homer. Homer says that uh, Hector, and other heroes were put, the bones of all these heroes, in a gold casket. And, and now we had for the first time a gold casket, and on the lid of the casket, uh, an emblem and decoration of a star, the sunburst star, which I believe that is a kind of an emblem. It's not uh, only decoration, because we have the same emblem on coins of Philip and other Macedonian kings, and also on Macedonian seals. Uh, that was, uh, well, an evidence that we are not uh, in the tomb of a commoner, even of a general. But apart from that, we had other, other objects and other evidence that we are in the tomb of, probably, of a member at least of a, the royal family. The lid of the casket opened easily to reveal a skull and other bones which had been partly burned and then washed. Some still bore the remains of a purple cloth in which they had been wrapped, while others supported a headpiece of pure gold. This was discovered to be a golden wreath of oak leaves and acorns, inspired by the sacred tree of Zeus. It weighed a pound and a half, and in a Macedonian context was certainly a symbol of royalty. As for the bones in the casket, experts now say they belonged to a man of between 40 and 50 years of age. Andronicus had long searched for an unrobbed Macedonian tomb. Now that he had found one of great wealth, dated by pottery to between 350 and 325 BC, there was one possibility he could no longer avoid. We had all of us the same feelings, uh, but uh, my assistants as younger, uh, well, more excited, I think, much more excited. And uh, I can say that from the first moment, uh, they were discussing uh, themselves uh, the possibility of being the tomb of Philip, of second. Uh, and I was uh, joking with you with them, what are you discussing? And uh, they didn't like to tell me exactly, because, uh, well, I was refrained a little. I, I didn't like to, uh, to, to think something like that. Philip of Macedon. 
the man who first conquered and then united the warring states of Greece against Persia, their traditional enemy. A brilliant soldier and statesman, Philip was 24 when he became king of a nation regarded as barbarian by the southern Greeks. Yet within a year, Philip had secured his frontiers against Macedonia's traditional enemies. And in the next 20 years, he turned that lonely and isolated area into the center of a great empire. Ancient swamps were drained and brought under cultivation, and forests were cleared from the central plain. As his professional army conquered the states to the west, north, and east, rich mines of precious metals came under his control. Within three years, Macedonia was financially stronger and its army superior in training and tactics to any other single Greek state. And even if Athens had sent out every man she possessed, it would no longer have been enough. Within ten years of seeing Philip come to power, the leaders of the city-states realized they would have to combine against his forces or be defeated. In Athens, 400 miles to the south, the greatest living orator and statesman, Demosthenes, was alarmed at the growing menace of Philip in the north. In several speeches, which have come down to us as the Philippics, he tried to sting his fellow senators into action. Now mark the situation, men of Athens. Mark the pitch that man's outrageous insolence has reached when he no longer offers you the choice between action and inaction, but threatens you and utters haughty language. He is not the man to rest content in possession of his conquests, and while we procrastinate and sit idle, he is setting his toils around us on every side. Philip has conquered your indolence and your indifference, but he has not conquered Athens. You have not been vanquished. You have never even stirred. Demosthenes was well advised to mark the ambition of Philip. But what he had no way of knowing was that at Philip's side rode a youth, his son, who was to become one of the greatest generals of all time. Men from those days to this have known him as Alexander the Great, conqueror of the ancient world from Greece to the borders of China. The Athenians, oblivious to their destiny, continued to ignore the Macedonian threat, and the speeches of Demosthenes in the face of danger became increasingly strident. Now, if it is possible to remain at peace, then I say we ought to do so. But if another, with weapons in his hands, holds out to you the name of peace, while his own acts are acts of war, what course remains open to us but resistance? He is not even a barbarian from a country that one can acknowledge with credit. He is a pestilent Macedonian, from whose country it used not to be possible to buy even a slave of any value. His taunts finally succeeded in spurring the Athenians to war. But Philip had already decided he would wait no longer. Here at Heronia in 338 BC, Philip fought his last campaign on the Greek mainland. Demosthenes, with a sword, was among the foot soldiers who opposed him that day. This field, which separated the armies, was not large. The right wing of the Athenians and their Theban allies was anchored here on the site of this mound. Looking north, they could have estimated Philip's army as 30,000 foot soldiers and 2,000 cavalry. Facing Philip and Alexander was an army of similar size, but less well trained and organized. An historian claims the battle was fierce and long, but that Philip's strategy won the day. By nightfall, 1,000 Athenians had died and 2,000 were prisoners. Under this ageless monument were found 254 corpses. Some say they are the dead of the sacred band of Thebes. But not much is known for certain, except that Demosthenes ran away when the fighting was fiercest, and that Philip emerged as ruler of all Greece with an empire which stretched right around the Aegean Sea. At Agea, two years later, Philip was attending his daughter's wedding before leaving on his long-planned campaign against the Persians. The year before, he had married his seventh wife, Cleopatra. Some say she had recently borne him a son. 
As he walked in a procession, he was stabbed by one of his bodyguards and died immediately. Those who had most to gain from his death were his first wife Olympias and her son Alexander, both of whom had cause to fear the presence of a new male heir to the throne. Although there is no proof against Olympias, she certainly ruled Macedonia as queen after Philip's death. And she and Alexander would have been among the last to see Philip's remains before the lid was closed and his casket placed in the tomb. But what made Andronicus believe that they were the remains of Philip? Searching in the debris 18 months ago, he found this gold ring. Now that it has been cleaned, Andronicus believes that such an object would only have been found in the possession of a king. Beautifully worked and adjustable here, where the gold has been turned to resemble a knot of hair, the band is the first found from antiquity. There is no other interpretation than that this uh, circle, this object, is a royal diadem. I mean, a royal crown. The Tarsos medallion, found elsewhere in Greece, is thought to depict Philip. The diadem on his head is similar to that found in the Vergina tomb. If the dead was a king, we know that between 350 and 325, no other king died in Macedon but Philip II. I know that uh, this conclusion is uh, awful. Uh, uh, terrified uh, myself also, but it was the only uh, answer I, I had to give to the date and to the, to the interpretation of this object. But apart from that, we found in the tomb these five heads. Now I know that we have more, but anyway, this one for me is the portrait of Philip II, because it looks like the one we know from the medallion from Tassos now in the Bibliothèque Nationale uh, de Paris. In profile, there are real similarities, but Andronicus did not have to rely only on resemblances. Philip's body bore the marks of many battles. While besieging the city of Methone, five years after he became king, he was badly wounded and lost the sight of his right eye. Andronicus believes that the right eye on this tiny ivory is a dead eye, and that this eyebrow reveals a serious wound. There is no positive identification of these two likenesses, although Andronicus has reason for thinking they may be Philip's parents. But he had no doubts when it came to this head. He is certain that it is one of the best likenesses of Alexander the Great as a youth he had ever seen. The 18-year-old with his long, stretched-out neck, the slight, energetic turn of the head, and the eyes looking upwards have all come down to us from Roman copies. At first, he thought this was a second portrait of Alexander. He now thinks it is the head of a woman. From the similarities between the two, particularly the shape of the nose, he deduced it was likely to be Alexander's mother, Olympias. But no matter how attractive, Andronicus prefers hard evidence to areas of speculation. And then we have this pair of glyphs. Well, there are uh, gilded, that means that belong, there is no any uh, possibility to be of two pairs. And it's obvious that the left one is shorter than the right. And also, uh, the form is different. There is an interpretation, uh, probably is not the only one, but we know that Philip was lame. The records confirm that Philip was wounded and made lame by a spear which pierced his leg. But have these ancient leg guards convinced Andronicus that he has found Philip's tomb? I'm not uh, absolutely confident. Uh, 
I, I said from the first moment that this is uh, an hypothesis, uh, a conclusion uh, based on archaeological evidence. I have no uh, the proof. I have uh, very strong evidence. But uh, what I said from the first moment, uh, the most important thing is not the identification of the tomb, but the finds themselves. Among the many objects in the tomb was this rusting and tarnished breastplate. Andronicus felt sure he had seen it somewhere before. Now in the Museum of Salonica, it has been restored and conserved. And Andronicus had seen it before. In the Museum of Naples is a mosaic rescued from a house in Pompeii. It depicts the Persian king Darius defending his kingdom against the invading army of Alexander the Great after the death of Philip. The youthful Alexander is portrayed wearing a breastplate identical to that found by Andronicus in the Vergina tomb. From the front, it is quite clear that the shape of the epaulets is exactly the same and the gold trim around the edges has been picked out in the mosaic. But these tiny lion heads are perhaps the most interesting feature. Used to secure other pieces of armor or clothing, they are evident on the mosaic. Yet Andronicus was equally surprised by the sword shown at Alexander's side. On the floor of the tomb was this magnificent iron sword decorated with ivory and gold. The ivory has fallen from the hilt with the centuries, but two of the three gold separating rings in the handle are still prominent. Alexander died in Babylon and his tomb has never been found. Could father and son possibly have used identical armor and weapons? Unlike other pieces of iron found in the tomb, the spears had never rusted and were like silver under the dust of the centuries. This fact suggested to Andronicus that perhaps the Macedonians were technically capable of making stainless steel more than 2,000 years ago. There were two chambers inside the tomb, and rather than risk disturbing the huge marble connecting door, the archaeologists entered the antechamber by making a hole in the wall. Inside the red-painted room, they found yet another sarcophagus with loose feathers lying on top. Standing in the corner between the connecting doors of the inner chamber and door jamb, was a gold-sheathed bow and arrow quiver, similar to a Scythian one encased in gold, discovered in South Russia. The scenes in relief probably depict the sack of Troy, and warriors are shown advancing with swords and shields towards an unseen enemy. Many bronze arrowheads and some of the wooden shafts were found in situ behind the gold casing. And several broad gold rings found on the floor probably came from the wooden bow which has disintegrated. The remains of decomposed material, wood, textiles, leather and ivory, gold leaf, ornaments and pieces of glass had settled onto the floor of the tomb. There were remains of furniture bearing gold veneer and decoration and strange shapes in metal left stranded by disintegrating shelves and wooden supports. After days of cleaning and restoration, the tarnished object was found to be a unique gold-plated pectoral, once worn, perhaps, by a queen of Macedon to emphasize her long, slender neck. 
finely worked gold on an iron base bore designs of horsemen and rosettes. But Andronicus' attention had already been drawn to a tarnished and twisted object which lay near the sarcophagus, half buried under fallen stucco from the wall of the tomb. When cleaned, it looked like this, an exquisite wreath of myrtle leaves and flowers which the experts in Salonica have restored to its former beauty. After removing the feathers and other material from the sarcophagus, Andronicus slid back the lid to find yet another golden casket. It was neither as ornate nor as large as the first, but once again it bore the sunburst of Macedonian royalty. The same symbol had also been found on many tiny gold discs scattered on the floor in front of the sarcophagus and on the sarcophagus lid among the feathers. Their final act that year was to open the casket. It gave them their greatest surprise and their greatest reward. Shrouding the bones of a woman was a well-preserved purple and gold cloth with a wonderful design of spirals, flowers, leaves and swallows. Andronicus and his team had held their hands over their mouths to avoid breathing on the priceless relic when they first opened the casket. But time had torn the cloth into a thousand pieces. But since then, the Greeks have managed to reconstitute and preserve large areas of the unique fabric. In the casket among the bones and the cloth was this intricate diadem, which Andronicus believes is the finest piece of Greek jewelry yet found from the ancient world. An exquisitely wrought piece of gold artwork, it is alive with stems, tendrils, leaves and flowers, spirals and springs. On a flower, motionless, sits a fly frozen by time. Released from the darkness of the tomb, only when Andronicus shone his torch into the gold casket less than two years ago. Protected by the casket, the shroud and the bones of the dead, the diadem needed little cleaning or restoration and was one of the first objects ready to take its place on exhibition in the Museum of Salonica last August. If Andronicus has indeed found the tomb of Philip of Macedon and there are fewer and fewer people prepared to argue with him on the subject, then another question naturally arises whose bones rest in the casket in the antechamber. Olympias was estranged from Philip and in disgrace when he was assassinated. And there are stories that she and Alexander murdered Philip's last wife Cleopatra and her newly born son shortly afterwards in a royal purge. Certainly Olympias would have been reluctant to allow a rival to Alexander to live. In the small tomb Andronicus found the bones of a woman and also of a newly born child or maybe of a fetus. Are these the remains of Cleopatra and her son? And could it be that Olympias arranged that she and no one else should lie in Philip's tomb after her own death? Many romantic ideas have been put to Andronicus, but there is no archaeological evidence, and without evidence Andronicus refuses to speculate. Manolis Andronicus knows that any answers he is likely to get to the questions of identity and dating are hidden in what remains of the Vergina Mound. He is also aware that he is going to have to face many more problems before his work is completed. Problems like those he faced in August last year, 
when his team found yet another unrobbed tomb. Here again the doors are intact, but there is no painted frieze above the doorway. The artist painted this facade onto organic material and not onto the stone, and the material and the painting have simply rotted away. Removing the keystone of this tomb, they saw that one of the interior doors had collapsed onto more and better silver bowls, but no sarcophagus. This time, the pressure was too much for the slender services available to Andronicus. His art restorers were tied up with the other tombs there was no more room to store artifacts in Vergina. And if he kept the tomb open, there was a real risk of destruction to priceless objects. In the end, he took a simple decision. He replaced and sealed the keystone he had earlier removed and entombed the beautiful silver and ivory, leather garments, paintings, gold spears and armor, knowing that he will have to return sometime in the near future looking for answers to new puzzles. And one of the most difficult tasks he will face when that keystone comes off next time will be how he is going to establish the identity of the Macedonian ruler laid to rest in this marvellous silver urn more than 2,000 years ago. <laughs>